Hello everyone. Welcome to Tarmac Talking. This is Anand Krishnan here with a new edition. This time we have with us Air Marshal Esaki Nair, AOCNC Training Command, Indian Air Force. With over 7000 hours of flying and many many accomplishments spread over 40 years of career. Air Marshal SRK Nair is also remembered as a man, the only man, the only Indian, the only pilot who has done a transpolar mission and also a circumnavigation. In the next couple of weeks, Air Marshal SRK Nair is landing his inspiring flight after serving the nation. We are here to hear some of the untold stories. Over to Air Marshal S.R.K. Nair. Tighten your seat belts. Welcome Air Marshal S.R.K. Nair. Thank you. To Tarmac Talking. Much. You are a pilot. You fly around. Today for a change, I am sitting in the cockpit and taking you on a flight. And here we go, taking off. We are heading towards Trivandrum. Your school. Okay. Loyola School. Yeah. Can you share with us your inspiring memories of school? I understand, you know, you are a very popular figure in the school, very, very popular part of NCC. Can you just tell us about your school day schooling in Trivandrum? Okay. Now that we landed in Trivandrum in Loyola School, that actually was my takeoff point. The early education I got in a school such as Loyola put me on a very strong foundation for the future. And I was fortunate to be associated with NCC Air Wing from a very young age. My liking or I will say fascination for the uniform is what attracted me to NCC in Loyola School. And thereafter I never looked back. Opportunities came my way. I made use of all opportunities. Practically all NCC camps I could attend, I attended aero modeling camps and uh, I graduated from school into college, married Vanis for a very short while, continued in NCC, I got a scholarship for flying through NCC and I started my flying career in Kerala Flying Club at Trivandrum. But soon after, I got selected for the National Defense Academy, so I had a break in flying and I went on for military training to National Defense Academy. Before we get into NDA, let me just hover around your school for some more time. Yeah. Uh, I understand you were so passionate about NCC. Uh, I happened to speak to uh, many of your schoolmates and they all said, they used to call you Radha. That's correct. That's yeah, correct. so yeah. they said, you know, Radha was very passionate. And in fact, uh, you were the under officer. Yes, that is correct. And you inspired many of your friends to join NCC. Uh, can you just tell us about those days when you were very active in aero modeling? How inspiring in the sense all those early days, I'm sure you know you would have set your goal that you will have to get into Air Force one day. Uh, what were those early days of aero modeling and plane making? And uh, who really inspired you? Inspiration were my seniors who were in the NCC and the instructors who were in the NCC. Once I joined the NCC, I found that the uniform is something that fascinates me. There is a regimen in life. There's a way you go about things very systematically. And I felt that it's a nice way to go ahead in life. And I wanted my friends, who were very close to me, to follow me and join the NCC. Many did so, though not very willingly. But they did try the hand to this way of life. And when it came to aero modeling, anything that flies is fascinating. So I was fascinated and I tried to draw in as many friends as possible into the NCC and the aero modeling. Some of course did and some did join the Air Force too. So it was early in my life that I found this fascination for the uniform and flying and I have been able to motivate a few of them. Trivandrum to me was Paris. You know, I loved 
traveling from my village okay. on vacations and you know, come there, big dream, big city. One of your friends said that, you know, all of you used to cycle together. And so what were those discussions? It was all about career, you know, it was all about, you know, getting into the, into the Air Force. Those cycling moments are moments I would like to reflect upon at this age, when I'm now superannuating. This is the time I'd like to reflect upon the early days when we found cycling the best mode of movement. Trivandrum, you know, is a small place. And we all used to live around uh, within about three to four kilometers radius. So we used to meet at a common place in the evening and discuss the present, the past, the future, dreams, ambitions of people. Those most wanted to become engineers, most wanted to become engineers. Those days of uh, days without mobile. So, you know, you had a lot of time to talk about your dreams, isn't it? Oh, yes. No distractions. Yes, life went on very smoothly without mobiles. We had more time to speak to each other in person and interact in person. Another interesting aspect, when I talked to a couple of your family members, came to know was yours was a very big family and the bonding, uh, you know, was huge. Yes. And, uh, you know, I was very surprised to know that all of you, at any given point of time, used to travel together. And they told me about this Matador van. Yes, yes, indeed, we have, <laughs> we had, yeah. The entire family members, be it going for a film or going for a function, everybody used to get into this Matador. Yeah. And then even some hospital visits, I am told, it, you people, your family made it a point. Everybody used to go in this Matador. Yeah. So it was, you know, it was a very close knit family. Uh, my father, of course, uh, was a father figure and he always wanted the family to be together and as the family became bigger, the vehicles also became bigger. That is how we graduated to a matador so that all of us could travel together, visit friends, visit relations. And another very peculiar thing was anybody's friend in the family was everybody's friend. So any problem or any celebrations, we all went together. Is the Matador still there? No, it is no longer there, but we still have photographs and fond memories of the Matador. Air Marshal Nair, you loved films, uh, you know, and war movies. Your friends, your classmates, you uh, have told me that you made it a point to watch all the war movies. Sometimes take your, you know, your friends along, buy the tickets, and you ensure that even they watched along with it. Yeah. That's true. Did those great war movies influence the little Radha to... Very much, it did. Guns of Navarone, Bridge of the River Kwai, to name a few. Uh, with whatever little pocket money I could save, I managed to see uh, some of these war movies. Not many came to theatres in Trivandrum. And some of my friends did come along to watch these movies and it definitely has an influence on you. The, the leadership you see in the iconic leaders of those years, and they were all picture I so well, they definitely had an influence on me. You are being talked about as a young leader, right from your school, college, all that. And now you spoke about leadership. How much of leadership skills you fine-tuned when you entered NDA? Leadership, to a certain extent, is there in you. Is there in every human being. But how you develop that quality of leadership depends on you. Like when I was in the NCC, it did not take much time for me to be recognized as a person with initiative, willing to do things and responsible. This is what my instructors told me. So I, I rose up to be a leader uh, right in the very young school days. And I used to be troop leader, as we used to be called those days. Then of course, when I went to NDA, the initial uh, few terms, that's almost a year, was a root shock and it took a lot of time to recover because with no strong service background, I went to a place where a lot of unexpected things happened. I found the going very, very tough in the first two years and I was, I will confess, at the rock bottom of my course, whether it is outdoors, whether it's academics, whether it's drill, but then after one year, once I got to the environment, which several others had come from signing schools and from RAMC and so on, after the first year, I found 
that I am on very firm ground. So did you at any point of time feel that, let me give up? Yes, not once, not twice, on many occasions. My, sir, my number, we, we all allotted a number when you join NDA. My number was 11948. What occurred to me is if 11,947 people have come to NDA and if 11,000 have passed out, so can I. That is the way I took things. And after the first year, that is from the third term onwards, I did not look back. In the fourth term, I became an appointment in NDA. In the fifth term, I became an appointment in NDA. And so also in the sixth term. So what helped you to uh, stick on to the target, the goal of completing? I didn't want to give up. I didn't want to give up. I wanted to cross obstacles as they came. Initially, I found it very difficult. Later, it became a little easier. Thereafter, there were no obstacles. Because when I passed out from NDA, from the bottom of my course, I came somewhere in the first few in the course. So all the people whom our research team have spoken to, we found that Air Marshal SRK Nair is a man who has converted all the challenges in life, all the challenges life offered into opportunity. Yes. So that particular script of challenges into opportunities, probably I'm very sure India played a big role. Very big role. It teaches you how, if you are determined, you can achieve what you think is actually impossible. There are very few things impossible for a human being to achieve, if he has the resources. And that is one place where you build your, up your tenacity, you know, your ability to overcome obstacles. You're young, your mind is young, your body is young, you're physically very fit. So that is where you come to know that what seems an obstacle at first glance can easily be crossed. Successfully passed out from India? Yep. Air Force? Yes. Those initial days. So where were you posted first? Could you just... Yeah, after my training in uh, Air Force Station Bidar, Air Force Academy and thereafter here in Air Force Station Alahanka, I was posted to the northeast, to the far east. I was posted to a place called Chabua, where we have an Air Force Station, a very large Air Force Station now. And we used to fly to the hills in the northeast. And those are memories which will live with me forever. We are seeing the lush green hills and very steep valleys. Look at the landing ground which, which, which looks like the size of your palm on a tabletop. I never knew an aeroplane can be landed there. But we all managed to do that. And there was a lot of charm in flying in the hills over there. In an aircraft called the Otter, which is a single engine uh, propeller aircraft. All right, so uh, in your career spanning around 40 years in Air Force, you have virtually flown all kinds of transport fleet. Why did you choose the transport fleet? You know, that was your liking towards the Not the exactly, not exactly. Uh, when, um, we were, we were, when we were training, just before commissioning, or just after commissioning, there used to be a medical examination held. So in the process of training, they, they uh, send you to various streams. So I was sent to the fighter stream. But when I went for what we used to call the high performance medical, here in the Institute of Aerospace Medicine here in Bangalore, they suspected some abnormality. They suspected. So I was put medically down temporarily. All right. And I was told to be here in Air Force Station Alahanka because of ease of uh, medical evaluation in the IAM. I found the environment in the transport fleet very good. And I found there's a lot of meaningful work that is done by the transport fleet. The fighters have their area of focus, so also the transport and helicopters. So I continued here in the transport stream uh, thereafter. Over to AN-32, getting it inducted into Indian Air Force, those initial Periods, yes. You played a big role. So what were you then in the Air Force as you were? I was in a flying office. Flying officer, okay. Having a fair amount of experience on the Otter aircraft when the AN-32s arrived. And we were fortunate to be selected in the first batch to be converted to AN-32s in India. Alright. We were the youngest. 
We were the least experienced. We were three of us. From How the old were you then? I was then around 26 years of age. So we were selected and we went for the first MCF. Once again, when the training started, we were at the bottom of the course because we didn't have a very sound background of heavy transport aircraft to come on in or medium transport aircraft. The syllabus those days was about 30 hours, but at the end of 30 hours, we were very comfortable and in fact, the three of us who went from Otters were the first five in merit at the end of the course. Then started the interesting phase when the AN-32s came to the east. Any new equipment coming to a place has got its challenges. If you address the challenge the correct way, the transition is very smooth. From Otters, Dakotas and Caribous to AN-32s because of speed, and way to the aircraft, it was a challenge. But the challenge was taken on in a very, very efficient manner by my seniors who were there to guide us. And it was a very smooth transition to AN-32s operating in the Northeast. So what were the challenges in the sense, you know, at least if you could just tell us one or two challenges. A typical challenge in the Northeast is narrow valleys, sharp turns, bends, extremely short runways unpredictable weather. All these factors I told you does not go well with flying. It does not go with, well with flying at all if you're flying an aircraft which is a little faster than what we're traditionally operating them. These were the challenges. AN-32s continue to be the lifeline. I was at Air Force Sulu recently and you know I saw, uh, I met a couple of pilots, they still fly uh, in very difficult conditions. Yes, you know, yes. On many occasions pushing the, this mission to the limits. Uh, so it is still doing a great service to Indian Air Force, isn't it? It indeed is. It's a workhorse of the Indian Air Force even today. Despite its age, brought in in 1984, we are in 2018, but it does a fair share of uh, work for the Indian Air Force. If I ask you one question about among all the platforms you've flown, what is that one favorite machine of Air Marshal Nair? It's a very difficult question to answer. I will put it this way. The most charming aeroplane to fly was the Otter. All right. So also the most difficult. The AN-32 was an aircraft you could take anywhere, anytime and do meaningful work. The IL-76 is a huge aircraft. It cannot go to all places, but does very, very meaningful work for the Air Force and the country. So each has got its area of operation. If you ask me favorite, I think all three have their special place in my heart. I would now want to take you to something you hid from your family, a mission that now you are famous for, the only man in Indian Air Force, the only Indian pilot to have done it, uh, the transpolar and circumnavigation. Cope Thunder, yeah. 9 hours and 40 minutes. Uh, that was in uh, 2003. 2003 in the month of June. So take us through first the preparations. Okay. The Indian Air Force was invited to participate in exercise uh, what they call the Cooperative Cope Thunder in USA, uh, in Alaska. And the Indian Air Force decided to send the IL-76 and I was chosen to be the captain of that um, aircraft which went there. So we had a pre-exercise meeting at Alaska, which was in the month of March. And I vividly remember, the sun never rose at that time, for the time of the year. It was bitterly cold. And after the exercise briefing got over, since we had about three, four hours time for the flight uh, out of um, the airfield close to us, close to Ilsen Air Force Base, the liaison officer who had come from Hawaii told me we will go for a drive and we will go and see the hot springs which is close by and by the time we come back it will be time for the flight. And so on the way back we stopped at a kiosk to have a cup of coffee. It was dark, it was around 8 p.m. When we were having coffee I saw the aurora borealis, the northern lights, the sea of colors in the sky. Beautiful isn't it? Beautiful. Uh, words cannot describe it. I had only seen photographs in textbooks when I was in school, in Loyola school. So that is what got me thinking. So this is from the North Pole or close to the North Pole. So I did a quick check of the latitude we were in. 
And that is when the idea struck that the North Pole is not too far. So when I came back to India, I mooted this idea to air headquarters that no aircraft from India has been to the North Pole. And if I am permitted, I would like an attempt to go to the North Pole and back, establish transpolar capability for the Indian Air Force and for the country. That is the origin. The Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights, that, that is where the, the thinking started. So we had almost about two and a half to three months for the exercise. So I got my team together and we started the planning process. It was planning for something actually unknown. So the Air Force agreed it right away? Air, Air Force, Force did not agree right away. They had their concerns. They had their concerns. That is because of, you know, nobody has done it. Nobody has done it. And when I mooted the idea, it was only an idea. All right. So I was told to come back with a plan. So I went back with the plan to air headquarters just before leaving for USA. And they told me, the Chief of Air Staff, then Air Chief Marshal Krishna Swami told me, looks good. If you are comfortable, go ahead. There is no pressing requirement. But if you establish transpolar capability, it's good for the Indian Air Force. It's another capability of the Indian Air Force. So with this as a motivator for us, we left for the USA. When we spoke to the USAF that we would like to do a transpolar flight, they were a little skeptical. So they called a navigator from Hawaii who specialized in North Pole flights. And we sat across the table. And he was actually quizzing us in the form of a conversation to find out how well prepared we are. At the end of the conversation, we were pleasantly surprised when he told us, you are over prepared. Your flight will go through smooth. Go ahead. So the U Yousef gave us a nod. Then I called back air headquarters and told them, we are doing it. And that is how it finally materialized. Flying in a place where there is no RT, that is radio telephony to converse with anybody. There are no land features. There are no beacons to help you navigate. So minimum instruments. Your compass is unreliable. So these are all the challenges when you fly to the North Pole, which we had studied in great detail. And you never had any worries about aircraft having any technical snag on all those? We were prepared. We were prepared. We were prepared. We were in the IL-76. We had flown this aircraft from India to USA. The aircraft was behaving perfectly fine. We were only worried about the navigation system because we have never seen how the compass behaves at those northern latitudes. But we had GPS with us on board. Nobody has ever done it in Indian Air Force asset and... Uh, None from India. What are the lessons from that one mission? And number two, your family said we didn't even know. Yes, my family, many things we do in the Air Force, the family doesn't come to know. They, even after something is done, they don't know that we have done such a thing. The, these are certain compulsions. Well, about the North Pole trip, it was a challenge I saw. And any challenge, if you view it as an opportunity to achieve, you will find it is possible to do it. Initially, the North Pole seemed impossible because the compass is not working, there is no radar, there is nobody to talk to, you are the crew by yourself. But when you start planning and you start talking to people, then things start falling in place. So that was a challenge, which I thought was an opportunity. And I had a fantastic team with me. Uh, I understand uh, when I was speaking to Mrs. Uh, Nair, uh, you know, there was some big celebration at, the, at your uh, base when you came back. Oh, yes. It is at that point of time she realized the significance of the mission. Yes. Well, you know, what you have achieved. Yeah. So, so where did you come back, you know, like where was the base? I came back, we took off from Isles and Air Force Base and we came back to Isles and Air Force Base. So it was, we came back after about 9 hours and 45 minutes. There were several people there, the senior leadership of the station to receive us and to congratulate us for having done a feat. Even the Americans don't fly there very often. So they were very impressed that we could do it and um, they said it was really inspiring to see an Indian Air Force aircraft go to the North Pole and back from one of our Air Force stations. What did uh, Chief Marshal Krishnaswamy say? He said to me over telephone that it is a job well done. We are proud of you all. You made the Indian Air Force proud. And the very year, on October 8th, during the Air Force Day celebrations, he declared that the Indian Air Force has now established transpolar capability. 
So uh, that was a great moment for you in your life. Very, very satisfying moment. And after that, Air Force never thought of any similar missions or you pro uh, you're aware of anything like that? No, we have not done any tr transpolar flight after that. Here, what I would like to mention is, we have done a transpolar flight. We have chronicled how to go about it, what to expect, the unexpected to happen, what are the emergency measures to be undertaken if something goes wrong, what are the instruments which are totally unreliable, what are gadgets like the GPS you need to have on board. So now everything is started down, there's a standard operating procedure. Should you need to do it, you can always read and follow what is written. From this inspiring mission, let's hit to 2013, you're landing at DBO. That's again another significant moment in your life. Yes. Could you take us through and uh, you know it's very very challenging, isn't it? So could you tell us about the, your DBO mission? Yeah. 2013? August. We landed in DBO in August in the C-130 Super Hercules. Much earlier, in 2009, when I was commanding Air Force Station in Chandigarh, we had landed an A-32 at Daulat Beg Oldi. That was in 2009. I was commanding Air Force Station in Chandigarh, and when you fly in that area, you realize the kind of difficulties the local population, as also the army deployed there have. Dalit Beg only is a place from where it takes weeks to walk down to civilization. There's a medical emergency, nothing can be done. It is at 16,600 feet, the highest airstrip in the world and not a prepared airstrip. It is not black topped, it is just compressed ground. So a lot of us got thinking, I mean, why not establish a capability to land at Dalit Beg only? Should there be a requirement? military or otherwise. It's another capability we established. We took a long time to plan, but we made it possible in the AIM-32. With this as the background, when I came back to air headquarters and we injected the Super Hercules, an idea came to the mind of some of my colleagues, why not land the C-130? Right. So now we plan for the C-130, with, C1, with the AIM-32 planning already in place. And since I was directly involved in the planning, this planning was a little easier and so also the execution. So on AIM-32, I have landed and taken off from DBO and on the C-130, I was on board when the aircraft landed for the first time. Uh, what are the challenges of landing at high altitude airstrips, if you could just, especially when you take these uh, massive transporters? What goes against aviation in the hills is the weight of the aircraft, the altitude and the temperature. The higher the airfield, the more difficult it is to operate because your power keeps dropping as you go up. So you have to choose very carefully the time of the year when you do this. August is the time when there's no snowfall, there's no, no snow on ground, and the temperature is reasonably all right. When I say reasonably all right, it is lesser than uh, positive five degrees. So the challenge there is operating in an environment where the aircraft performance is adequate to handle eventualities. A transport aircraft landing in a place like Dalit Beg Oldi, where no vehicle goes, you only find mules over there. First of all, is very, very inspiring for our army people posted there and also the locals that help is at hand. Only helicopters to land there with very few passengers coming back. But big transport aircraft landing there is a very big boon for our people there. You have taken part in many, many operations of Indian Air Force, including the Kargil. Could you just throw some light about some of the most unforgettable moments as an aviator taking part in? You know, I am, I'm not going to list out because there are so many, like virtually almost all operations we're part yeah. of. Yeah. Take us to Kargil first and then later on to some of the key missions that, yeah. the, the challenges. It was the stories that could inspire the future aviators. I'm fortunate that I got the opportunity to take part in almost all operations throughout my service career. Whether it's Maldives or Sri Lanka or Parakram or Kargil, I've been very, very fortunate. Each of them gives you valuable lessons to learn professionally. So I had seen all this and also operated for a lot of disaster relief operations. So when Kargil came, 
it came as a surprise to us. It took us by surprise, no doubt. But the Indian Air Force uh, reacts very well to surprises. We had limited number of IL-76, limited number of a 30s to operate. We had to move some of our combat squadrons up there. We also had to move a lot of troops to lay and toys. And you are only 24 hours in a day. So we used to practically fly round the clock in the planes, moving our combat units from various places to the northern area and by day flying from Chandigarh to Leh, Thois and back. So this is round the clock operation we did at a time when weather was not very favourable for operations in Leh. All right. The temperatures are very high, I told you earlier, high altitude and uh, weight and temperature does not go together. All this was happening in the month of May. So we found it very difficult to operate the IL, heavily loaded with troops and equipment into lay at that point in time. Some of those landings were very tricky. We took calculated risks because that was a need of the hour. Other one question I uh, wanted to ask is that uh, Air Force role in humanitarian assistance, you know, so that's something which you have directly involved, new platforms, new possibilities, bigger challenges, you know, so that in this changing scenario, Air Force has really, really, really stood up to the challenge. Absolutely. And what are the factors that has helped Air Force to get there all the time? In disaster relief, there is something called the first responder. Invariably, it is the Air Force which is the first responder for reasons of having speed, reach, capacity to carry and a wide array of flying machines from a small helicopter to a huge aeroplane. We can reach every nook and corner of the country. So the Indian Air Force has got the assets, it's got trained manpower, we've got the experience and so invariably we are the first to plunge into it. Look at Buj, look at Orissa Super Cyclone, you look at the tsunami in Southeast Asia, you look at what happened in Uttarakhand, where I happened to be personally there for almost three weeks. You look at Srinagar, you look at Gujarat. We are fortunate that we are equipped to handle these disasters and we are fortunate that we are given an opportunity to go to these areas of disaster and save the citizens of the country. Since we are entering the last phase of this journey, as we are ready to land, let me bring you back to your home base, the training command now. Yeah. Three years almost, more than three years here. A uh, lot of uh, phenomenal uh, changes. Uh, Air Force, uh, you know, as part of its modernization, yes. has brought in. And majority of it has also got into the training patterns. Uh, be it here, be the AFA Hyderabad, all that. What are the key contributions you were able to pilot being the training command head in terms of training the future air warriors? If you could just list out those. Like you rightly said, training is most important and training command is the gateway to the Indian Air Force. What we train in training command is what the Air Force has for the next two to three decades, I'm talking of the uh, human resource. So we play a very, very important role for the future of the Indian Air Force. And if you've noticed what the Air Force has gone through in the last about a decade, we have seen technology being inducted in a big way. An unprecedented rate of technological improvements in the Air Force, new systems, new platforms, very, very advanced. So, we have to put our, especially our airmen, through a training curriculum to handle this very technologically advanced equipment. So, that was our frame of mind, that we have to improve the training and shift gears to make these men be prepared to operate very, very advanced weapons. That is the biggest challenge. So we did some tweaking of our training curriculum and uh, we exposed them to certain kind of training so that at the end of the training, they can handle this equipment. I remember writing a story uh, almost 10 years back when 
these changes started coming in. Um, the new aviators, the new recruits, yes. the challenges because you know they are a different breed altogether. Yes. Taking them, training them, making them understand the philosophy of the FOs, uh, there is a challenge because it's a different world altogether. Has all those challenges been now ticked off? In the sense, you know, there is distraction among youngsters. You know, so how is the Air Force handling, you know, that particular phase? The societal changes we have undergone in this country is huge, especially in the field of communication. More than direct man-to-man -man communication, you will find it's on uh, WhatsApp and, you know, it's on mobiles. and So that brings in a lot of changes in the young officers who are coming into the Air Force. Many of them have spent more time on their appliances rather than on the games field. Right. So there are changes. But that is what we get. And that is what they are. So we had to tweak and we constantly tell them the importance of staying away from social media during crucial times, looking at the services, the way it needs to be looked at, the kind of involvement they need to have with training, practicing what is being taught, the ill effects of social media. Do they listen? They do to a very large extent. But, they big, do cha do. but big challenge. It's a big challenge. At times, punitive measures are required. There are times we've resorted to very strong disciplinary action against people who violate these norms. There is a challenge in the society coming in today, but we must understand that is the way the society is and that is what you will get into the services. So our job is to mold them, so take them the way they are, pass them out the way we want. That is what we have to do. Any out-of-box thinking in training to handle this difficult? Yes. My chief is a very practical person. He keeps telling us, tell them case studies like a story. All right. How an accident happened because somebody was on social media till the wee hours of the morning and had not taken adequate rest, got into a situation he could not handle. So when we tell the young trainees that these are areas you've got to be careful, look what happened to so-and-so. He sleep. did this. So sleep on time. Sleep on time, yes. So we are able to influence them with these real-time uh, case studies. The Air Force uh, decision to open up the fighter streams for women and uh, it's been two years, six women pilots already there. But a story what many people doesn't know is that the kind of back-end preparations, the kind of mentoring that you have done. Because I have spoken to these pilots and they have said at different phases here, FA, be the... Um, so one pilot said it was like uh, uh, talking to a father. Uh, you know, and then so, and of course, I know that Air Force is not seeing them differently. No changes in any training patterns. Everything. None whatsoever. Yeah. So, how did you enjoy the role of? Uh, it was almost like uh, uh, just guiding your daughter. Here's an opportunity for the women in India to fly a combat aircraft, a fighter aircraft. The opportunity was given to one and all of them. Some of them volunteered. Some did not personal choice and from those who volunteered we handpicked those we felt are capable of this mission so we convinced them that flying a fighter aircraft whether it's a man or a woman the plane does not know so if you're good and if you're confident and if you're willing here's an opportunity we treated them at par the only thing is we told them just because you're a woman don't think the fighter plane is out of bounds for you they took on the challenge. Some of them are doing very well today. Even it's a uh, even opportunity for one and all. There was nothing that you had to do differently as uh, the CNC, or you know, when you were just dealing with these women pilots. No, nothing except that when the course started, we had to tell them that at the end of this course onwards, we will be opening fighter flying for women, and we had to mentor them to tell them you're all the same. It is only your mental makeup that matters. So in terms of training, there was nothing different we did. So, although in the background, we did some studies about the physiological aspects of women and there was a white paper which was made and given to them to read what the medical science says about you know, pulling, uh, pulling high forces. They're aware of that. 
So now the first lot of three women pilots are already flying uh, the yes. fighters yeah. and you know they're uh, you're satisfied man. Very satisfied because I feel opportunities are equal. Just because you're a woman, it's not different in any way for an aeroplane. What are the plans now that you're ready to hang your boots? Your family members told me that in a very, very meticulous 365 days, everything goes by a plan. There is no single day that went by uh, in a Marshal Naya's life without a plan. 40 years landing with a lot of tons of achievements. Always kept the cool, I'm told. And there is one side of you which, you know, even we all would like to see that apparently you're a very, very jovial person. Uh, you know, the friends, relatives, uh, your colleagues, a lot of... So we found that you have written scripts for dramas in school, school. in your school, school yeah, yeah. and also for your unit, some, you know, some events. So you uh -huh. love writing. We are going to be challenged with journalists with your writing post retirement. <laughs> no, no, no. A lot no, of not people at all, do not that. at all. No. Because a lot of air marshals do write. I know, I know. Yeah. I, know. <laughs> I have no intention of taking to writing in any in professional field or any other field. I would like to catch up on a lot of things I missed in the last about maybe about 10 to 12 years. You get busy as you become senior, catch up with friends, spend time with your classmates, your course mates, with whom you have not been able to spend time. Relief the memories of the old days and laugh when you can. In one of your speeches what you uh, gave, uh, which you know I was there, so you, uh, I could get a sense of feeling that operationalization of DPO is probably one of your biggest pin-up moment in your life. Yeah. Is it right? It indeed is. Though I can't say that is the only one. Even uh, operating to the North Pole yeah, the was flight. a challenge. Yes. It was indeed a challenge. DBO and operating to North Pole were two major challenges I took on, which went off well. So back to your favorite two words, opportunities, challenges, challenges, opportunities. In every challenge, there's an opportunity. If you see the opportunity, don't let it go past you. Grab the opportunity and you overcome the challenge. Is that your message to youngsters who would want to get into Air Force? Youngsters who have already got into Air Force and, you know, building a career. All youngsters, whether getting into the Air Force or otherwise, I will tell them, there are opportunities that come your way. If you are smart, you will see the opportunity and you will make the best of the opportunity, whether joining the Air Force or otherwise. Thank you so much, uh, Air Marshal S.R. Th thank you, thank you very much, thank you. I've been, I've been seeing that um, you're very fond of talking to people and asking questions that inspire the younger generation. I think that's a very good way forward for our entire nation. Yeah. You've done a lot of yeoman service. I'm sure you'll continue to do this to inspire the youngsters. That's my assignment. And now we have a team backing up. And thanks for all the opportunities you two gave. Uh, it was a great learning, uh, you being around. And this is uh, a small um, token of our love. Uh, you know, we have just started this series, Tarmac Talking. Yeah. Um, I'm sure uh, this cup, uh, you know, as you get on to the next role in life, this cup should inspire you. This is from all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thoughtful. Yeah. Now that we are in Air Force Station Alahanka, which is the host base for Aero India, may I present you a book on Aero India, which we compiled last year. <laughs> all right. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. And pages. Yep. My pet bird. Thank you once again.